What's up, everybody, and welcome to a brand new episode of How About That. I'm your host and producer, Vinny Langdon, and we have a great show for you. If you're like me and you're a history buff and you always have questions like, man, I wonder what was there before that building and who owned that and what was it like before all these skyscrapers in New York City and Mm -hmm. you have a million questions going on in your head, well, you'll appreciate this episode because my guest is Patricia Salmon, who is a historian. You were a part of uh, the Staten Island Museum for many years. And give my viewers a little background on yourself. Sure. I um, worked for the Staten Island Museum for about 15 years. And I eventually was uh, promoted to the curator of history position, a job which was amazing. And I, you know, always be grateful for the rest of my life that I had it. Uh, Prior to that, I worked at Clay Pit Pond State Park Reserve as a naturalist historian. Uh, Then I went back to school and I started, you know, uh, researching history more and more and more and more. And I'm, I'm just crazy about history. I write books. I retired a few years ago and I'm working on more books. So I'm just having a good time. (laughs) There you go. So you have written, you know, several books. And in fact, I have a few of them here. You know, I (laughs) always am intrigued by murder mysteries. And they're the ones that make your brain go and kind of go crazy at times (laughs) where you're going, wait, that really happened and trying to put your brain into that time period. Now for someone like you, you know, let's first talk about the, you know, the murder mysteries. Did you have a, how'd you go about having a special interest I mean, being tied with the museum or was this before that? I, as long as I can remember, I've always been interested in murders and mysteries. To be quite honest, when I was a kid, I would watch reruns of the Alfred Hitchcock show, which was all about murders and mysteries occurring. Um, Then about 1984, a family member of mine disappeared. So, I mean, not to be too overly serious here, but that really, of course, you know, uh, caught more than caught my attention. Our whole life uh, evolved around it. And I think that really contributed because we were literally searching for him and working with the New York City Police Department. And, um, you know, that was a whole process. So that just added to this, you know, interest that I had in murders and mysteries. I'm Irish. I like a good story. So I, I mean, I think that's really what a lot of my history interest evolves around is just that I like to hear and read a good story. So, um, you know, so a lot of the mysteries that I uncovered were, are not solved. And I, um, you know, so I, I tried to figure out who I thought perhaps may have done the murders. I don't give a lot of analysis in the book because the books, because I am a historian. So I, I pretty much just give the facts. But, uh, you know, I have some opinions about those that are not solved as to, as to who, you know, may have been responsible. But, um, you know, volume one, Murder and Mayhem on Staten Island, sold so well that the, the History Press, the publisher of the book, asked me if I had enough material for a second volume. I said, well, I'm sure I have enough material for five volumes. No. <laughs> but, um, you know, we, so we did volume two, the, the Staten Island uh, slayings book, and they the Murder and Mayhem is by far the most popular book I've written of the five books that I've done. And um, of course, there's a co- an accompanying lecture that goes with it. So when, you know, when people ask for that, I, you know, I give, I'm more than happy to give the lectures on those subjects too. Because as I said, they're near and dear to my heart. They all focus on Staten Island before the 1930s mainly because that's my time period as a historian is from about the 1830s to the 1930s. So it's, I'm very interested in that time period. And so those two books focus on that time period. Very cool. And I'm sure compiling these books, you know, it took time because when someone, anybody produces nonfiction work, you're going to have people saying, well, is it a hundred percent accurate? And for you doing a lot of research with history, I mean, were you looking up old newspapers, census records, and trying to track down the old streets? Cause some of the streets mentioned they're not named what they are today in present time. So that probably had some challenges as well, right? Oh, definitely. Yeah. I start with the newspaper resources. They're abundant online. The Library of Congress has a fabulous resource for newspapers. 
uh, New York State Historic Newspapers.com has wonderful resources, information. Uh, you know, it's just amazing. It's amazing what you could find online. I mean, when I initially was a historian, there was no online research. <laughs> you know, you went to an archives, you went to the library and dug through microfilm or whatever. But uh, to have all this material online, I mean, you can find the transcripts of court cases online nowadays. You know, you can find the old magazine articles, photographs. The New York Library's digital collection is simply amazing when it comes to doing research and research about murders. As you said, the census records are all pretty much online, free of charge, uh, thanks to the United, as the United, no, the Mormon Church. They have FamilySearch.org, and you can find many census records, death records, social security records. I mean, it's, to me, it just blows my mind what I can find online now. But, you know, you still have to go to the New York Public Library, and check out the microphone, because a lot of Staten Island newspapers are not online yet. You know, if you have a run of the New York Times, the New, the New York World, uh, and a number of others, but unfortunately, there's very limited Staten Island advance online. Staten Island Register is not online at all. So, you know, I always check out the newspapers first, and then I try to find, you know, any kind of court records that might be available. Um, even the county clerk, the Richmond County clerk now has records online where you can find the history of home ownership. Uh, so it, it, you have to dig and, and kind of know what you're looking for, but I mean, you can find that information too. Uh, every once in a while, not so much with the murder books, but like even with the book I'm writing now, I can interview people. Um, I'm writing now about women and historic women on Staten Island. So, I mean, there's people I can go to and, and speak face to face with and do oral histories and things like that. So uh, there's a, a number of resources. I can go to the Staten Island Museum archives. I can go to the uh, Staten Island Historical Society, Richmond Town archives. So I'm blessed with resources where to find information, to be quite honest with you. <laughs> Very cool. Very cool. Yeah. Now, the way I found out about you was really interesting because doing family genealogy and research. And I remember, you know, probably five years ago, typing in Google and typing in my great grandfather and I see his name highlighted in your book. And I'm thinking, whoa, that is yeah. exciting. <laughs> and finding out that, you know, he was a milkman and right at the the height of the prohibition era. And, mm -hmm. you know, I'll mention briefly, and you can kind of fill us in and fill the viewers in, but, you know, he comes across, you know, two bodies laying on the side of the road. And, you know, we're talking 1923 and, you know, scary times, especially at that time when back then the murder rate, you know, isn't high as, you know, we hear it on the TV every day and go, oh, another murder. Okay. But back mm -hmm. then you got to think those people, that mindset, the whole Staten Island community was probably just going, who are mm -hmm. these people? So tell oh us a little God. bit about that. <laughs> yeah. I mean, your grandfather was delivering milk. I believe it was the Meadow Brick Dairy. And he was driving uh, down the road in Dongan Hills. I believe that was Seaview Avenue. And he literally saw two he thought it was animals at first because there were two, the women were wearing fancy, beautiful fur coats. And one of them was even moving. So, I mean, you can only imagine how he felt when he saw this. So, you know, he immediately called the authorities and they came and they found these, you know, 1920s era women. Uh, one of them was barely alive. The other one was dead. And I mean, they had been mutilated and, 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 and killed in a very vicious way. And uh, the authorities came and they, you know, they didn't have any identification on them. Finally, they figured out who they were. It took, a, it took a few weeks to figure out who they were. And the police set about trying to figure it out. They put a dragnet around Staten Island. They had police at the ferry terminals. There was more than one. So they were pretty short staffed just covering all the terminals, one at St. George, one at Fort Richmond, you know, one in Tottenville. And they actually never did solve that murder. It was, it was very sad uh, that these women were killed the way they were. One of the women actually had a wooden leg and they were able to identify her because she had a receipt for a new wooden leg in the pocket of her uh, jacket or something like that. So they went to the man who made the, the wooden leg and, and they were able to get her name. You know, it's, uh, it's, it's interesting because 
her, her last name was Blandino. And about two years ago, I had a phone call from an archivist at Binghamton University. And Blandino's ex-wife, ex-husband, had actually been questioned about the murder. Now, the phone call was from uh, the man who was arrested, his granddaughter. She was doing genealogical research, came across the Staten Island Slayings book and, mm -hmm. and contacted me through my website to talk about that. She even gave me a picture of him. And I oh, have wow. that in my records now, too. So I get all kinds of situations where people will just come to me and say, Oh, you know that that book you wrote about Polly Bodine murder trial? That story you wrote about? Yeah, Polly um, uh, Polly's brother was my great 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 grandfather. You know, or I'm related to them. I'm a, you know a Van Pelt, or I'm a Bodine, or and it, I'm constantly meeting people like that, especially for the more modern stories. I won't write about anything after 1930 because. I don't want to step on toes or bring up bad memories or, sure, you know, sure. cast anybody in a bad light. Uh, so I purposely don't write about times after that. I do talk about <laughs> several of the serial killers on Staten Island, Richard Deganwald, Richard Rogers, and a couple of others. But I, I, as I said, I try to stay before the uh, 1930s or earlier. Right. Now, besides the negativity and the, you know, the crazy murders on Staten Island, there's a lot more positive history that we can talk about, too. And, you know, would we look at the overview history of Staten Island and, uh, you know, we always hear in the beginning, you know, an ex Italian explorer, Mr. Verrazano, <laughs> came up to the Hudson area and, you know, tell us about, you know, some of the highlights of the early days of Staten Island and how it became what it is today. Sure. Well, it was 1524 and Giovanni de Verrazano pulled into the Narrows and, you know, he saw Staten Island and he saw what would become Staten Island. He saw Brooklyn, what would become Brooklyn. But he did not land on Staten Island in his journal, the ship log, I should say. He wrote there was an ill wind blowing from the direction of the island, so they didn't want to risk having any problems, you know, with, with making an attempt at landing a smaller rowboat or something like that. So they just, that boat just went out to the Atlantic and, and, uh, and explored the coast, let's say. Uh, the Verrazano, the name of the boat was the Dauphine. And that's translated as dolphin. So people may wonder why the mascot of Staten Island, the College of Staten Island, is the dolphins. That is the reason why. But um, you know, eventually Henry Hudson, you know, came in around 1609, September of that year. He too, you know, came into the harbor, was amazed at this amazing harbor. I mean, the world evolved around shipping. You had this deep water harbor where all kinds of boats could come into and be safe, and protection from any hurricanes and things, for the most part, <laughs> that blew up the coast. And, you know, he knew he found something pretty major here. And he actually did send a boat over to Staten Island. And the, the, the Native Americans that were on Staten Island at that time, the Lenape, were generally peace-loving people. But there was some kind of a skirmish between the two and, and a man by the name of John Cole was shot with an arrow through his neck and died. But, but even after that, they still had, you know, uh, transactions. The, the guys on the boat gave the Indians you know, tobacco and some other items and the, and the Native Americans gave them, you know, beans and corn and, you know, some supplies and things like that. Actually, the area around Tap, uh, Tompkinsville Park if you go down where that train tunnel is, the SIRT goes into the train, historically that area was known as the watering place. Mm -hmm. And so when ships crossed the Atlantic Ocean coming to what became New York City, um, they would stop at the watering place to actually pick up fresh water and, and firewood because they had, the way to cook was with firewood. Even though you had a wooden boat, you had to make a fire right. to cook stop at this watering place and they get the fresh water and they get the firewood for their for their stoves and eventually you know became known as the watering place and as a matter of fact today if you go to Tompkinsville Park there is a plaque that was put up by the daughters of the American Revolution in honor of the fact that that was the watering place wow. so from 
there. There was a, a permanent settlement established at the watering place. That didn't survive. There was another attempt at permanent settlement. That didn't survive because of wars with the Indians and Native Americans. But um, eventually in 1661, we see a permanent settlement established at Arrow Car, not too far from uh, one of the uh, cemeteries, uh, St. Mary's cemeteries in that community. And 1661 is now our official anniversary for permanent settlement. That was, you know, we've evolved from there, so to speak. <laughs> right. And then fast forward, I know we look and we learn about, you know, our first president, George Washington. And we often, you know, hear ties with, you know, Philadelphia and up in Boston. But did George Washington really have, you know, an uh, area to call in Staten Island? My... From my knowledge, Washington never stepped foot on Staten Island. So a lot of people think he did, but he really didn't. Initially, Staten Island was, you know, a pro-continental army, pro-declaration of independence. But the British uh, actually made their headquarters on Staten Island. And when you have 30,000 British troops and Hessian troops breathing down your throat, you're going to say, yay, King George, I pledge allegiance to King George. So eventually, the island was considered a Tory stronghold, and Washington even said something about his, he wrote about his invertebrate enemies on Staten Island and how the people were so disloyal and everything. But, you know, when the British arrived, they had, they had gold coin, they had silver coin, and the, the Continental Army just had paper money that was kind of useless. So the um, Staten Islanders were an, at first happy to see the British for, you know, commercial reasons. They sold them firewood, sold them pigs, sold them beef, and they were able to make money. But after a few years, when the money started running out and the, and the soldiers started getting bored on Staten Island, you know, things started to change and Islanders were not very happy with the presence of the British Army. But what could they say? <laughs> they couldn't say anything. They, were, they had muskets, they had cannons, they had everything to keep the Staten Islanders in line. Wow, amazing. Lots of history, lots of history. And, and we're actually living in a historical period now where, you know, my yeah. generation, we could tell my great grandkids that, hey, we lived through a lockdown, we lived through a pandemic. And this is at the really only time that Staten Island in New York has experienced something related to quarantine. And there was a quarantine war back in the 1800s, right? Uh, it, yeah, I mean, a thing, in 1799, they started a quarantine at the Tompkinsville uh, area. If you know where the National Lighthouse Museum is today, right next to the ferry terminal, there was a quarantine facility established there. They were taking people off ships, and if you had an infectious disease like uh, yellow fever, cholera, uh, anything, influenza, anything, tuberculosis that was infectious, you were taken off the, the ship and put in quarantine at the quarantine station in Tompkinsville. Now, the station ran from the water's edge up to what is, through what is now uh, Hyatt Street, up to about St. Mark's Place, and then over to practically Victory Boulevard. And I mean, this place just filled up, filled up, filled up. Now, the people in the neighborhood worked there. Many of the people in quarantine were not happy to be in quarantine. If you were a poor immigrant who just spent your life savings on a ticket to come to the new world to start a new life, and you're sitting in a yellow fever hospital, you might try to escape, and many of them did. So a lot of these diseases spread to the community, and you had epidemics, and, and, and the locals were not at all happy about it. So they asked the state of New York, who ran the quarantine, to move it, you know. And so the quarantine officials asked people at Coney Island, we're going to move this here. Is that okay with you? And of course, people at Coney Island said, no, we don't want that place here. So they right. said, well, we'll send it to Sandy Hook. And the people in Sandy Hook said, no way. And then they decided Princess Bay or Princess Bay as it is. And they bought a farm from a man named Joel Wolf. They started to build a quarantine, but the neighbors there said, no, we don't want this pestilence in this neighborhood. We don't want to deal with this yellow fever coming into uh, affecting our people and, and the 
flu and, and every other thing. So they decided to burn it down. It was 1857. So they burnt it down. The only thing that was left was like the pier and the flagpole and a, and a privy from what I've read. And so the people in Tompkinsville said, these are smart people in Princess Bay. Why don't we just burn down this one in Tompkinsville? Mm -hmm. So on September 1st, 1858, many of Staten Island's leading citizens, these were not, you know, usually rabble rousers or whatever you want to call them. They took any patients that were at the quarantine, took them out, put them on a hill, make sure they were safe and warm, and, and they set the place on fire. They weren't happy about what they did on the night of September 1st, so they came back on September 2nd, and they set the place on fire again. And the state of New York attempted to, you know, have the quarantine there, but it really didn't work. So eventually they brought in floating hospitals. Then they established Hoffman and Swinburne Island on the sandbars that were off of South Beach. And that's why we have those islands today. They were used for quarantining incoming immigrants who may have had infectious diseases or who did have infectious diseases. There you go. And if you're standing out on the pier of South Beach and you always wondered, what are those islands out there? Can I swim to them? What's going on? Well, now you know that that's what they were. Very interesting. Well, today there's a lot of things that people can do if they're in Manhattan or they're in Bronx or another borough or out of the state and watching this. And they're like, Staten Island seems like a very unique place, family oriented. There's lots to do and lots of history to explore. And mm -hmm. tell us some of your recommendations of some of the hot spots. I mean, there's so many, but right. list a few of them. <laughs> well, well, you know, some of the places, of course, are not open. But the one thing that remains open is the Staten Island Ferry. And I mean, it's a free ride and you could see unbelievable history from the ferry. You could see the Statue of Liberty, you could see Ellis Island, Verrazano Bridge. As you're approaching Staten Island, there's St. Peter's Roman Catholic Church. Um, there's uh, the, the man, uh, excuse me, the Oh man, I can't believe, go blank. Anyway, there's so much to do on Staten Island. When you get off that boat, you can go to the Alice Austin house, which while it might be closed right now, it's on a beautiful beach called Bono Beach. They have an exhibition, the Alice Austin house, about Audrey Lord right now, who actually lived on Staten Island for, for a while, for several years. Uh, you could go to Historic Richmond Town, which is a living history museum. Uh, all kinds of amazing historic houses that have been restored. Uh, they have a museum there. One of the exhibitions is made on Staten Island. Staten Island had a tremendous um, manufacturing history. Everything from soap to beer to uh, linoleum was made on Staten Island. So um, personally, I'm, I'm working on a new project with a group of people. We're trying to restore the Olmsted Beal House, which was at one time owned by Staten Island's, or the world's most famous landscape architect, Frederick Law Olmsted. So it's not open to the public yet, but when it is, I hope everybody comes and visits it. Very cool. Very cool. So we're going to go ahead and wrap things up. If people are more interested, you actually run a Facebook group, Pat Sam and History, where people can, you know, have questions or, you know, post old family photos or they'll might see family photos and, you know, yeah. like, like the Blandino family might say, hey, that's my great, great grandfather. And <laughs> you never know. So and tell us where we can find more information about you and your books. Well, I have a website. It's called patsalmonhistory.com. And there's a page about, you know, about me and, you know, what I've done in my life. And there's also the page to buy all five of the books. One of the books is about Staten Island cemeteries. One is about the Staten Island Ferry. Two are about those murders that occurred on Staten Island. And the fifth one is about brewery barons, the old German lager beer uh, brewery barons who established these amazingly huge breweries on the island. Um, so yeah, my, my contact information is there. You can always write or go to the Facebook page, send questions, send posts, and you know. Uh, we love talking about history. We love talking about Staten Island history. And um, you know, I think it's just a blast. 
There you go. And you also teach, you know, classes too. If, you know, there's a group of students, I know a lot of people are now doing these, these virtual classrooms and if they're interested and maybe they, you know, a teacher is trying to teach New York history and they want to have you as a guest one day and are, is that an option as well? Absolutely. I'm, I'm open for Zoom uh, interviews just like this one. I'm teaching a course to the United Federation of Teacher Retirees in the fall um, uh, via Zoom. I, I teach classes with the College of Staten Island, with Wagner College. Those are generally in person, but maybe we, I, I might be trying to get some Zoom with, with those two organizations. I make I have a whole list of programs that I present live, so hopefully we'll be back to normal one of these days and I can present to, you know, and I do walking tours when things are are going correctly as they should be. And yeah, I just, I love to do public programming. Gotcha. Well, thanks again, Pat Salmon, for being a guest on the show and uh, keep the history alive, keep preserving it. And we'll see you guys all on another episode of How About That. I'm Vinnie Langdon, guest Pat Salmon, and we'll see you guys next time. Thanks so much. Okay. Thanks, Vinnie. Take care. Bye-bye, everybody.